on World News Tonight. Enter Liz Truss. The UK prepares for a new Prime Minister amidst a looming economic crisis. Trump victorious. The former US President trumps the government with the approval of a special master. Flooding fiasco. Heavy downpours drown out entire cities, leaving hundreds of thousands helpless against Mother Nature. And musical magic. Korean theatres come to life with melodic verses and vibrant performances. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening. Thank you for joining us on World News. As the United Kingdom faces an economic crisis like never before, new elected Prime Minister Liz Truss is making preparations on how to deliver on her promises of tax cuts and improve cost of living. Meanwhile, Boris Johnson delivers his farewell speech, effectively confirming his stepping down from the post. Chosen as Britain's third female Prime Minister today, tonight Liz Truss is being compared to Margaret Thatcher, facing inflation, strikes and a recession and promising tax cuts. We will deliver, we will deliver, we will deliver. Soon to be former Prime Minister Boris Johnson tweeting congratulations. His scandal-ridden tenure ending with a long goodbye this summer with stunts like flying in a fighter jet. Now Liz Truss looking at a long, hard winter with skyrocketing energy bills fueled by the war in Ukraine. She may need billions just to stop British businesses like pubs from going broke. All this as the nation's queen is increasingly frail, unable to make it to London because of mobility issues. For 70 years, Prime Ministers have travelled half a mile to see her at Buckingham Palace. Tomorrow, they'll fly 500 miles for a handover at Balmoral Castle, a constitutional moment unprecedented during the Queen's reign. Liz Truss hoping to reaffirm Britain's long-standing special relationship with America after, at times, rocky relations between President Biden and Prime Minister Johnson. Former U.S. President Donald Trump was handed a legal victory in the controversial Mar-a-Lago court battle with the judge approving his request for a special master to oversee the documents seized from his home. A federal judge on Monday agreed to appoint a special master to review records seized by the FBI during its search of former President Donald Trump's Florida estate. U.S. District Judge Aileen Cannon in West Palm Beach, Florida, said in her ruling the special master will review documents the FBI seized that could be subject to attorney-client privilege or executive privilege. Judge Cannon ordered the Justice Department to put its criminal investigation on hold but said she would permit U.S. intelligence officials to continue conducting a classification review and a national security damage assessment. She wrote that Trump faces potential harm through improper disclosure of sensitive information to the public. Cannon was appointed by Trump in 2020, just months before he left office. The FBI and the Justice Department have become vicious monsters. Trump, without evidence, has accused the Justice Department of launching a partisan witch hunt against him, and his lawyers argued that an independent third-party review of the materials would be an important check on the government. Trump is under investigation for removing government records, some of which were marked as highly classified, from the White House after he left in January 2021 and storing them in his home at his Mar-a-Lago estate in Palm Beach. The Justice Department has said it is also investigating possible obstruction after the FBI found evidence that Trump's team may have deliberately concealed classified documents when agents tried to recover them in June. A group of former federal prosecutors who all served in Republican administrations also filed an amicus brief in the case, saying Trump's request for a special master was, quote, unprecedented, filed in a court with no jurisdiction and manifestly frivolous. Cannon gave both sides until Friday to file a proposed list of candidates to be special master. While one half of America is dealing with unprecedented heat waves and wildfires, several areas of the U.S. are under flood watch now as torrential rain triggers a state of emergency with entire towns being submerged in the rapid flow of water, affecting hundreds of thousands of Americans. 
Tonight, on this Labor Day holiday across the country, severe weather is dealing a withering blow. The heavy rain has soaked states from Alabama to Rhode Island, where in Providence, part of I-95 is completely flooded, leaving holiday travelers at a standstill. The governor is urging everyone to stay off of the roads unless absolutely necessary. It's moving the car. It's all part of a massive storm system pushing to the east, blowing through Dallas, oh. where heavy winds destroyed part of this structure still under construction, strong enough to strip the bricks from the side of this building. In southern Indiana, massive flooding swept through homes, killing one person and displacing dozens more. When it let loose, it let loose. I imagine most of us down the Ohio River somewhere. And tonight, more than 78 million people remain under flood watch, including parts of North Georgia, where the rain left its mark on the small town of Somerville, leaving cars, homes, and entire streets submerged. Even as the waters begin to recede, they leave behind a trail of closed businesses and a crippled water supply, forcing a boil water alert. All of it coming at the tail end of a turbulent summer for travel. Problems that forced the airlines to cut back on flight schedules starting in mid-July. Despite a night of worry, Typhoon Him Nam Noor has passed through South Korea's second largest city, the port city of Busan. Many people in the city were expecting the huge storm to cause chaos, but it seems the damage was limited and Busan emerged largely unscathed, apart from some minor damage here and there. The strongest typhoon this year has passed by the port city of Busan. Typhoon Hinnam Noor barreled through Korea, bringing gusty winds and heavy rainfall. In Busan, the Korea Meteorological Agency said that the typhoon had caused 7 to 12 meter high waves and winds of 40 meters per second. Around 3,400 households lost power temporarily on Tuesday morning. 53 roads were blocked and public transport and flights were halted ahead of the typhoon to reduce the chance of damage. There were no reports of any deaths or missing persons in Busan, but one person has been reported in Ulsan City. There were a little over 130 emergency calls in Busan, but fortunately, compared to earlier reports, the damage seems relatively small. Locals breathe a sigh of relief after a night of worry. I was very scared. We were very close to the coast, so when I saw that there was going to be a tsunami-like wave on its way, I was so scared that somebody was going to get hurt. After making landfall at Koja City in southeast Korea, the typhoon headed past Busan into the East Sea and is making its way northward. Now the locals along northern parts of the East Coast are bracing themselves for the upcoming impact. One of the two suspects related to the lethal stabbing spree that occurred in Saskatchewan was found dead by Canadian police. And the hunt continues for the remaining suspect on the run. Meanwhile, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in a press stood in solidarity with the affected families and condemned the attacks. One of two suspects in a mass stabbing spree in Canada was found dead on Monday, according to officials. Brothers Damien and Miles Sanderson are suspected of murdering 10 people and wounding 18 others on Sunday in the province of Saskatchewan. The killing sprees become one of the deadliest attacks in modern Canadian history. The stabbings occurred mostly in James Smith Cree Nation, a sparsely populated indigenous community. Rhonda Blackmore with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police on Monday said the body of Damien Sanderson had been found there. His brother remained on the run. Police did not rule him out as a suspect in Damien's death. His body was located outdoors in a heavily grassed area in proximity to a house that was being examined. We can confirm he has visible injuries. These injuries are not believed to be self-inflicted at this point. The exact cause of death will be determined in conjunction with the Saskatchewan Coroner's Office. Police said that while some of the victims appeared to have been targeted, others were apparently random. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau condemned the attacks and offered his government support on Monday. Yesterday's attacks in Saskatchewan are shocking and heartbreaking. My thoughts and the thoughts of all Canadians are with those who've lost loved ones and with those who are injured. This kind of violence, or any kind of violence, has no place in our country. He also said that flags on federal buildings across Saskatchewan had been lowered to half-mast as a show of solidarity. Questions surrounding a motive remain. Indigenous leaders said the attacks may have been drug-related. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side.
Welcome back to World News tonight. Recessions are imminent in the Eurozone as new reports show drastic increases in cost of living thresholds and soaring energy costs. Countries in the region are preparing to face the brunt of the impact in the months to come. The Eurozone is almost certain to enter a recession. That's what new surveys released Monday strongly suggest. S&P Global's Final Composite Purchasing Managers Index, or PMI, fell to an 18-month low of 48.9 in August. Anything below 50 is a sign of contraction. Investor morale in the block also fell to its lowest since May 2020. The surveys showed the cost of living crisis is deepening and consumers are saving money as they face up to a possible recession ahead. Services activity in Germany, Europe's largest economy, contracted for a second month running in August. In France, services managed only modest growth, with purchasing managers saying the outlook was bleak. Now the European Central Bank is under mounting pressure, with inflation running at more than four times its 2% target. It faces the prospect of raising interest rates aggressively just as the economy enters a downturn. A rise in borrowing costs would add to the pain for indebted consumers. Monday also saw the euro drop below 99 US cents for the first time in 20 years. It comes after Russia said its main gas pipeline to Europe would stay shut indefinitely. Gas prices soared as much as 30% across Europe in response. That only added to fears of a recession and a tough winter ahead for businesses and households hit hard by rising energy prices. One of the main reasons for the recession in the Eurozone is because Russia has cut gas supplies to Europe, citing the West's sanctions against Moscow for its invasion of Ukraine. In a bid to try and solve their energy shortages, France and Germany have agreed to help each other through the crisis. Russia's state-run gas giant Gazprom announced last Friday that it would halt gas supplies through Nord Stream 1 due to a technical fault, which it blamed on difficulties having turbines repaired in Canada. Putin's spokesperson Dmitry Peskov also blamed the EU, the UK and Canadian sanctions for Russia's failure to deliver gas through the key pipeline. Due to concerns over energy supplies from Russia, European markets closed lower on Monday as investors ponder economic risks in the region. The pan-European stocks 600 provisionally ended down 0.6 percent after recovering from earlier in the day. However, auto stocks plunged nearly 5 percent to lead the losses. Amid the energy crisis, Germany and France have agreed to work together to help each other out. French President Emmanuel Macron said he will be ready to provide Germany with gas, while Germany has agreed to send electricity to France if needed. If I have to say it simply, Germany needs our gas, and we need electricity produced from the rest of Europe, notably in Germany. Macron added that the infrastructure needed for France to deliver gas to Germany would be finalized in the coming months. Meanwhile, the EU is preparing emergency plans to cap gas prices or separate power prices from the soaring cost of gas, with energy ministers from the bloc due to meet on September 9th to discuss these issues. Soaring food costs deal a heavy blow to a considerable number of nations daily. The United Nations warned that Somalia is on the verge of collapse as the threat of famine seems unavoidable for hundreds of thousands of Somalis. There are concrete indications that famine will occur in parts of Somalia between October and December, the UN's humanitarian chief said on Monday. Martin Griffiths made the warning in the capital Mogadishu against a backdrop of worsening drought and global food prices hovering at near record highs. I've been shocked to my core these past few days by the level of pain and suffering we see so many Somalis enduring. Famine is at the door and today we are receiving a final warning. The Horn of Africa is experiencing its worst drought in 40 years. Experts say the region is on track for its fifth consecutive failed rainy season. Griffiths said the current situations and trends resembled those when famine hit Somalia a decade ago. Except now they're worse. The unprecedented failure of four consecutive rainy seasons, decades of conflict, mass displacement, severe economic issues, 
are pushing many people to that, the brink of famine. More than a quarter of a million people died in the 2010 to 2012 famine, and half of them were children. Chilean voters resoundingly rejected a new progressive constitution in a referendum following a nearly two-year process that aimed to reflect a broader array of voices in the nation's document. After Chile overwhelmingly voted against a proposed new constitution, which would have been one of the world's most progressive charters, President Gabriel Boric pledged on Sunday to push for a new constituent process. Almost 62% of voters rejected the new text in Sunday's referendum, with over 99% of ballot boxes counted. That's compared with nearly 80% of Chileans voting in favor of drafting a new constitution two years ago. Boric, whose left-wing government is largely tied to the new text, said cabinet changes were coming, and his administration would work to draft another constitution. Center-left and right-wing parties that promoted the rejection campaign have also agreed to negotiate over the new text. I pledge to do my utmost to build, together with Congress and civil society, a new constituent itinerary that will provide us with a text that, taking on board the lessons learned from the process, manages to interpret the views of a broad majority of citizens. The rejected proposal was drafted in response to widespread violent protests that gripped the nation in late 2019. It focused on social rights, the environment, gender parity and indigenous rights, a sharp shift from its market-friendly constitution dating back to the Augusto Pinochet dictatorship. But polls showed public support had dwindled amid controversies surrounding those elected to draft the document. Nearly 13 of 15 million Chileans and residents who were eligible to vote cast ballots across more than 3,000 voting centers. Voting in Sunday's referendum was mandatory. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A suicide bombing near Russia's embassy in Kabul has killed two Russian diplomats and four Afghan citizens, injuring 10 more in the blast. China successfully sent a new batch of remote sensing satellites into space from the Xichang Satellite Launch Center in southwest China, Sichuan province. The satellites were launched as the fifth group of the Yaoyang 35 family and entered the planet orbit smoothly. Israeli President Isaac Herzog arrived at the German parliament in Berlin to hold a speech. It's his first speech in front of the German parliament with his predecessor Ruben Rivlin last giving a speech in late January 2020. A rocket attack struck Kharkiv and destroyed a residential apartment building in a central part of the city. Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city, is close to the Russian border and has been under constant shelling throughout the conflict. Squid Game makes history again by becoming the first non-English series to win an Emmy. The K-drama earned awards at the event which honours artistic and technical achievements in TV production such as editing, costuming and direction. And that's all the news here from us at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Musicals made in Korea have been gaining quite a bit of attention in recent days. We're leaving you tonight with spectacular musicals in South Korea. Thank you for joining us. Have a great night.